Order, order. Matt Western to move the debate. Um, I beg to move that this House has considered one public estate. Uh, can I start by thanking the Backbench uh, Business Committee for allowing me to bring forward this debate. And to you, Mr Paisley, uh, it is uh, a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship for the first time. Uh, I bring this debate forward today because I believe it's important to review programmes and policies. And as far as I can see, there's been very little scrutiny of the one public estate programme since its launch some six years ago in 2013. In fact, it was launched by the coalition at that time, largely in response to the government's priority to reduce the deficit. And whilst I acknowledge that ambition, uh, my great fear is that we are witnessing a wholesale asset stripping of the public estate with very little public or central government scrutiny. However, I also preach, appreciate that its aim was as much to seek to join up central government, local government, and other partners to make better use of public assets and their land. Through public partners sharing space, the idea was that running costs could be reduced and surplus assets could be sold to generate money or released for other purposes to create new jobs and homes. In fact, it had three core aims. To create efficiencies, generating capital receipts and reducing the costs, create local economic growth, creating new jobs and homes, and deliver more integrated customer-focused services providing citizens with better access to government. And my interest in securing this debate was, in fact, motivated through my own time as a county councillor for Warwickshire County Council, as well as a local project uh, involving new offices for Warwick District Council, my local authority, which I believe could have made use of the One Public Estate programme, and, in fact, also my wider interest, which many will know is in housing issues, and particularly in social housing. Now, I hope to first outline the, the aims of the programme when it was first launched and provide my own assessment of its success and perhaps unpick some of the failures of the programme, particularly in relation to housing. In launching the policy in 2014, Francis Maud, who sat as a minister in the Cabinet Office in the years 2010 to 2015, outlined the impetus for the programme as thus. In the absence of a comprehensive coordinated strategy, Central departments and their arm's length bodies all did their own thing, he said. He goes on, they did it without talking to each other and without thinking about their local partners. And because no one was looking at the bigger picture, departments would take on expensive new leases when government freeholds remained underused or where local authority accommodation was available just down the road. And I'll come back to that and illustrate it with a local example. And perhaps... Uh, Later in my speech, I'll also return to what Mr. Maud was, was saying in 2014, as I think his words were particularly significant. It is certainly eerily apposite to the case of Warwick District Council, my local authority, and its proposed self-described new headquarters building in the centre of Leamington. But there was merit in Mr. Maud's approach, and I applaud his thinking at that time. The notion of providing services in one place, for example, as opposed to several, could also better serve the public by providing easier access to local government and other public services. And the obvious example would be a job centre sharing space with the council's welfare and housing team. At its initial trialling in 2013, the programme focused on 12 councils and has since expanded rapidly so that just over 300 councils now participate, which is 95% of all English local authorities. The One Public Estate Programme also works with 13 government departments and hundreds of health and blue light organisations. It works by providing a combination of grant funding from central government directly to partnerships who have to bid for this funding and providing expertise which local authorities and other public bodies don't always possess. And the purpose of the funding is to cover upfront costs associated with getting a project underway to unlock those potential assets, for example, through, say, remediation works on land, which could be used for housing. One Public Estate has also formed a partnership with MHCLG to jointly administer the government's land release programme, which is designed to release land for 160,000 homes on government land and a further 160,000 on local government land by 2020. And this was, was formulated back in 2017. Now, there have been some successes to the programme, and in my assessment, I would say that the aims of one public estate are in the main laudable. As someone who spent part of his career bringing change to an organisation, 
I wholeheartedly support the aims of the, the programme to rationalise the use of public assets in order to reduce the cost for the taxpayer and also to provide government services in a more joined up and accessible way. In fact, shortly after its national launch, I proposed a one Warwickshire estate as a county councillor, as I could see that the county and district councils in my community could make much better use of the land and buildings they owned to serve each other's needs. Across the country, there have clearly been some, albeit limited, successes. Most impressive is that to date, the program has created 5,700 jobs. The latest phase is expected to create a further 14,000 new jobs, and this is a tangible benefit for people up and down the country. To date, it is estimated that running costs associated with partner projects have been reduced by 24 million pounds, and the new phase is expected to save taxpayers 37 million in running costs. However, I would point out that while any savings to the taxpayer is positive, a 24 million saving over the five years is relatively small beer to the overall cost of government. There are, so, there are individual cases that will bring big benefits to their local communities. Just looking through the various material available on the program, the development of public sector hubs, if done in the right way, is a positive step forward. For example, the West Suffolk Partnership is currently developing such a hub that will have space for a school, leisure facilities, including a swimming pool and health centre, children's centre, public library, job centre and a citizen's advice bureau, as well as space for Suffolk Police, West Suffolk Council and Suffolk County Council. This will surely benefit how the local community interacts with the public sector and the project is expected to reduce running costs by four million to boot. Another example is in Cornwall, the police, fire and ambulance services have co-located into a new joint headquarters in Hale, saving £500,000 a year on running costs and releasing two sites for redevelopment. The new facility has enabled the emergency services to reach many more people within the target response time. And since the success of this first tri-light co-location, Cornwall partners have since progressed to a number of further blue light property co-locations and also piloted emergency service collaboration with the tri-service offices being rolled out across the country. Now, I mentioned about Warwick <coughs> District Council in my area, where they have been seeking to build themselves a new office. I do not believe it's necessary, because there is ample and, and va vacant void space in the county council, just two miles up the road. And I will come back to this a little bit later. But there have also been failures of the program. Perhaps the greatest of all failings has been the wholesale disposal of public land and ignoring the greatest crisis of all, the delivery of much-needed public housing, this is my greatest concern, because to paraphrase, they don't make land anymore, and together with its people, public land is the community's greatest asset. We are in the midst of a serious housing crisis. 277,000 people are homeless. 1,157,000 households are currently on the housing waiting list. There is a clear and urgent need to house people at the sharp end of this crisis. But we also hear from older constituents who are renting privately and unable to afford their rent, a problem which will only increase. It is estimated by 2040 up to one-third of 60-year-olds will be renting privately. We also know there are many younger people trapped in the private rented sector. And one of the major barriers to doing all this, providing housing, is land. Sky-high land prices are preventing local authorities from being able to, to, to access the land to build on and incentivizing cash-strapped councils to sell off the land they do, do own rather than to build on it. And it is my simple view that, in principle, I will indeed give way. I congratulate my honourable friend for securing this debate. When he talks about uh, social housing in particular, there's five major cartels in this country that the government should tackle, because what they do get involved in is land banking, as I call it, for want of a better term. They get outline planning permission, then sit on the land until it becomes more valuable, and then, of course, house prices for the private sector goes off through the roof. That's one of the big problems should be tackled. Should it, does he not agree with me about that? Western. I thank my honourable friend for his intervention. Of course, he makes an extremely important point. There is uh, an oligopoly going on here where there are just a few players controlling our land. And increasingly, I see local authorities actually coming to arrangements with these big players, with these developers... And, uh, and that is preventing this land from being used wisely, I think, uh, in delivering the sort of housing we need. I think with such a colossal social crisis before us, we should be using all suitable public land to build high-quality social rented council housing, without exception. Not 50% here or 40% there, but 100% of all such land. And I fear, with good reason it would seem, 
that the One Public Estate Programme was designed more to incentivise the public sector to sell its precious land as part of a national asset stripping programme than to use the opportunity so afforded to design in more efficient delivery of public services or the facilitation of building social rented housing, which would be of most social benefit to most communities. A relatively small number of homes have been delivered by the OPE so far, just 303, which is a failure in itself. But overall, the land that has been released will enable a further 2,550, with an estimated 10,000 homes more over the next five years. It worries me that I cannot find the data on how many of these homes are social rented or even affordable. I suspect most are not. Or how much of this land has been released to local authorities to build council housing. I suspect most has not. It would be helpful if the minister is able to provide this data for us today. What I do know, however, is that the government's estate strategy revealed that around $2 billion has already been generated from selling more than 1,000 buildings in the last four years. £164 million worth in capital receipts from land and property sales have been raised as part of the OPE. How much of this land could have been suitable for delivering the social rented council housing we desperately need, I wonder. But in truth, any such need or means of facility to meet that need has been has been is fundamentally undermined by prevailing attitude that public sector assets and land are best released to the private sector. And I think it's fair to say that this was the view of what is now seen as a surprisingly neoliberal coalition government. Coming back to the Francis Maud speech I referred to earlier, he also went on to say, and I quote, we want to release property back onto the market. We identified assets which could be released between now and 2020 in order to generate $5 billion for the taxpayer. To be fair, it would be ap appear that this current government's priorities have changed from the ones of the coalition government. The <coughs> Prime Minister has claimed that austerity is over, although the public has yet to see any evidence of that. And she has also claimed she wishes to solve the housing crisis, naming it as this government's number one domestic priority. Indeed, there has been reform to the borrowing cap so that councils can, can begin building council housing at scale again. But then a cap should never have been in, put in place in the first instance. I urge the, the Minister, therefore, to look at, again at how the One Public Estate Programme operates in terms of releasing public land and to shift its priorities so that public land that is suitable for developing social rented council housing is prioritised for doing so, instead of flogging it off uh, to the highest bidder. And if I could just turn to the Defence Estate and the Defence Estate Optimisation Programme, which provides a very good example of the potential of OPE but also its failings. The Ministry of Defence currently accounts for 2% of the UK's land mass. The government recognises many of these sites could be better used, particularly relating to housing. The Ministry of Defence therefore plans to release around 90 sites of its most expensive uh, properties before 2040 and potentially releasing land for 55,000 homes. This, of course, relies on linking up the ministry with the relevant local authorities and providing them with the upfront costs and expertise needed to make the most of these sites being released. This means the OPE is well placed to fulfil this role. Indeed, it is already involved with discussion relating to 12 of those sites. But if we dig at a, a slightly deeper level, however, we'll see that the opportunity for mass social rented housing programmes on this land is being totally missed. Let's take one example of St. George's Barracks in Rutland. The barracks are due to close in 2021, and the master plan developed provides for 2,200 homes as part of a new garden village. The OP programme was awarded £175,000 back in December 2017 for project management, consultation, surveys, and master planning of the St. George's Barracks site. So far, so good. However, when we delve into the master plan, we can see that only 30% of the homes will be affordable. Worse still, of this, 30%, 50% will be affordable rent, which we all know is not that affordable, 35% starter homes or other affordable home ownership products, and 15% rent to buy. It appears that none will be social rented housing, a prime example of a fantastic opportunity missed in terms of OPE and genuinely affordable housing. I will indeed give way. Thank you for giving way. And, 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 uh, I, I did speak to the Minister this morning before uh, this, this debate was taking place. Uh, it, it's very important, obviously, I believe it's very important that any land that is sold 
there's a purpose behind that, the savings of money, which obviously when, when the partners come together. But what's equally important, as the Honourable Gentleman is outlining in his contribution to the debate this morning, is a need to ensure that whatever land becomes available, there's a, uh, a requirement for social housing and for opportunity for those who don't have the same assets to, to, to uh, buy or purchase or rent houses. In Northern Ireland, we had a system for, uh, uh, for a developer in land that he would we, it was a suggestion that we set aside 10 per cent of that land for social housing. It wasn't a rule, but it was a suggestion. Does the Honourable Gentleman feel that maybe what government should be looking at is something maybe more um, uh, objective here in, in, the, in the mainland, where that land is set aside for social housing, that it's in law, and does he feel that that might be a way of, re of retaining land for social housing and thereby for people who can't get housing if we don't give them the opportunity to do so? Order. Uh, if members wish to make speeches, please put their names on the order <laughs> paper with the uh, <laughs> chairman of the debate and happily accommodate them. Uh, Mr. Matt Western. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his intervention, uh, which I think it was. Uh, and he makes a very valid point uh, that, that, you know, that there is, I think, a need to, to legislate for this. There is such a huge need, as I identified earlier, you know, with was it 1.2 million uh, people uh, homelessness, in homelessness. And therefore, we have this massive social crisis in this country, all because, as the, my previous uh, honourable friend who made his intervention about the land banking that's going on across the country, and we've seen this, whether it be in commercial land, with the big supermarkets of yesteryear, just taking up options, and now we see it with the housing developers and the, ho the home builders who have huge number of options across the country in Northern Ireland and here on the mainland. And it is they that are controlling the prices and the rollout and the build of housing in this country and what they will allow to be built and what is viable for them because of the profitability that they want to achieve. And so therefore, as say in Amsterdam, where you look at all housing projects, they have to deliver 80% social housing. 80%. So the 10% figure or the 40% figure or whatever the, the, my honourable friend was saying, whatever figure we choose politically is the right figure. I personally would want to see 100%, which is the way the Dutch authorities are looking to go in Amsterdam, uh, is what we need because we have such a crisis. The shelter report from back in January, uh, its report on the need for social housing, identified that we need to be, build three million social rented properties in the next 20 years. That's 155,000 every year for the next 20 years. And that is why I think we should be looking to use all this land for its most, to realize its greatest value. And its greatest value has to be in its social value, mm -hmm. not simply in the financial receipt. So let me summarise and let me be clear. I do support the overall aims of the One Public Estate Programme. It has been important in trying to achieve uh, a change in the mindsets of those uh, in, in the various uh, public sector authorities and our ministries to try and deliver better outcomes. And its simple approach of seeking to establish a partnership model across the sector was and remains right. The notion of, or the simple idea of mapping the public state, understanding through audit what is out there, what we have, that local authorities and others can use. The establishment of a strong governance mechanism with representation across the public sector was vital in driving delivery. And the engagement of public sector partners as early as possible to ensure it would meet, or the project would meet, meet the needs of local communities. And this is all creditable and right. And when delivered effectively, it can produce savings to the taxpayer and, most importantly, improve local services. But I am absolutely not convinced that this is happening as widely or as openly as was originally hoped. I can only draw on my own local experience in Warwickshire and with my Warwick District Council, my local authority rather, where there has been no real appetite to exhaust the options of sharing assets. We still have a police headquarters in Warwickshire and we have a fire headquarters in Warwickshire, both on prime land, and there is considerable opportunity for a master plan to improve the delivery of services 
whilst enabling best use of assets for the public purse. Mm -hmm. And I think the Suffolk example I gave earlier demonstrates a positive example of what can really be achieved. But there are examples where I think uh, across the country there is this asset stripping, this, this wholesale industrial sell-off, really, mm -hmm. of land. And my fear is that through the Public Accounts Committee or through this place, there is not proper scrutiny of what is going on. Yet billions of pounds of public assets are in play. And I would urge, say, SIPFA to be more closely involved. In my own investigations, I realized that there was this one particular company involved with my, dis my local district council, work district council company called PSP, who it, I discovered are involved with 22 different authorities across the UK. Now, as I understand it, there has been no procurement process that they have followed. Yet they are advising and involved in the disposal of these assets. Now, surely SIPFA and others should be looking at this. And, and that's what I believe the, uh, the government uh, property uh, department agency should be looking at, and so should the Public Accounts uh, Committee as well. But the ambition, the utilization of those assets for the maximum possible benefit in our communities is really what we should focus on and how we realize true social value. In practice, this means a shift in the program from delivering as much money as possible, i.e. the highest receipt, through the sale of assets and instead releasing land for local authorities to, to deliver best services, best joined up practice and high quality social rented council housing to finally get to grips with our housing crisis. I look forward to hearing the contributions of others, and indeed those of the Minister, but I would urge us all to think about what is our most pressing need, and that is delivering low-rent social housing, and only public land can deliver that. Thank you.